So, uh, good morning, Ajahn. Good morning, good everyone. Good morning. <laughs> uh, we are very glad to um, have Ajahn Brown with us uh, this morning, uh, I mean today, uh, to lead this day of mindfulness for for every one of us here. And um, yeah, Ajahn is very wise, just a moment that I am actually the one who needs some introduction, but not Ajahn Brown. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, I won't uh, want to uh, take um, much time, and uh, without further ado, um, uh, let's welcome Ajahn Brahm with a big round of applause. Hi. <laughs> Very good. How many of you have been to my talks or classes before? Wow, it's all of you. Who, well, let's to put it another way, who hasn't been to see me before? Ah, welcome, welcome, welcome. Excellent. The reason I say that is because some of the stories which I say or explanations, it's helpful if you've heard them before, uh, but then I have to know if you haven't heard them before, you may sort of misunderstand them. But nevertheless, it's really great to see you here. We're going to be start talking about mindfulness now. And with mindfulness, we have to be careful <laughs> you just got a cushion behind you. Did you realize that? Excellent, very good. Thank you. Uh, with the mindfulness, people have so many ideas of what mindfulness is, but you'll know it's a correct form of mindfulness if when you go home that your partner... I'm just looking. There's so many... F there's one... Two, four, five, six. It's only like most of you are female. <laughs> that means men aren't mindful? Or did your partner send you here to become more mindful? <laughs> no. You know, one of the reasons uh, why people uh, practice mindfulness is to make themselves more peaceful and happy in life. And it was, I just was mentioning to the driver who brought me here this morning, uh, why is it that so many people seem to develop things like cancer these days, or depression, or stress-related diseases? Isn't there something missing in our society that it seems that these incidents of uh, diseases increase and increase and increase and increase? How many of you had COVID? How many didn't have COVID? <laughs> Not very many. But I never had COVID, even though I was still teaching and traveling and going to many other countries to give uh, talks like this and retreats. How come that I missed out on COVID? It wasn't I was trying to avoid it even. I was kind of jealous of the monks in my monastery who did get COVID. The reason was they could go and retreat for nine days. And I, <laughs> I had to stay working and covering some of their jobs. And that's how we looked at it. If mindfulness, you understand, why do diseases happen? Why do they get worse? You know, why? A lot of times is the way we regard these incidents in life. And it's wonderful if we can always put some positive attitude towards whatever we have to experience in life. The positive attitude to COVID, I said, well, it means you can go and retreat for a few days. The positive, the positive attitude to going to the dentist. I'm not sure what the dentists are like here in uh, Hong Kong, but I remember going to the dentist's surgery to get a checkup, and then you had this most comfortable bed, you know, which actually almost like suited to your body. It wasn't like flat, like hotel beds. You can just you know, move something under your knees to actually to increase the bending of the knees. And the back, you know, this, even the bottom, you know, it had a depression there for your bottom, so it's really comfortable. The beds which you saw in dentist surgeries were the most comfortable beds I've ever been in in my whole life. 
And not only that, that when you were having some work done on your teeth, the dentist could talk, but I couldn't say anything. I had all this stuff in my mouth. Which means for once, no one could ask me any questions and, <laughs> and I couldn't give any talk. Or I could say, Ooh. <laughs> So <laughs> because of that, even going to the dentist, I found was a very wonderful experience. So whatever happens in life, you always look upon it with a positive mind state. Then you find that the sicknesses don't last that long. A lot of times that people just believe what they're told by experts. I'm not an expert. I never did any studies on medicine. But nevertheless, my understanding of how my body works that comes from lots and lots of uh, deep meditations on mindfulness. This is one of those examples. As a monk, sometimes people give me all sorts of food. Some I know what it is, some I don't know what it is. And when I don't know what I'm eating, sometimes you eat the wrong things. And when you eat the wrong things, you get sick. It's very fortunate now, even like when I did get sick once. I was in Malaysia many years ago. And when I got sick, I had to give a talk. There's about, I think about 3,000 people in the audience that evening. And when I gave a talk, I said, I, know, I think I better go back to the room or back to my toilet or something. I said, no, 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 please, just one more question. So they asked the question, and then I said, I really do have to go now. I said, no, no, can't we ask another question? No. I was quite firm. But even I was a bit too late. As I was walking off the stage, <coughs> projectile vomiting. Do you think that was unpleasant? That was one of the most wonderful, lovely things I've ever done. The benefit of that, they realize that this monk is not exaggerating. He's not asking for this type of food or that type of food because of desire. Because he can't digest it. If he doesn't get the right type of food, ugh, you'll see more of me being sick. And from that day on, when I went to Malaysia, people always looked after me. So, if there are some things you don't like, and your family and friends say, no, 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 it's okay. I eat this all the time. It's not really you know, spicy food. It's not hot. Maybe for you it's not hot, but for a quite low it's very hot. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever you're doing, make sure that if you are sick, you let other people know about it. And you have many benefits. So that's one of the reasons why that I'm usually very healthy, but still there's sometimes that people make something and it gets, you know, they keep it for a bit too long and they get some bacteria in it. And on this occasion, I wasn't vomiting, but I had uh, food poisoning. Have you ever had food poisoning before? It's very painful. I am a very restrained monk, but when I got food poisoning, you had these contractions in your stomach, these spasms. Fortunately, I was in my cave, no one heard me. If you did, I went, ah! Ah! <laughs> and it was just uh, automatic, you can't stop yourself. Ah! <laughs> and sometimes I do this because it's very good to get people awake and pay ah! <laughs> attention during a talk. I know they did ask me, do you want any uh, PowerPoints? Ah! <laughs> That's my PowerPoint for, the <laughs> for this talk. So what did you do? Now as monks, we live over in uh, forest monasteries usually. And forest monasteries, we live there because it's secluded. It's a long way from anywhere. So 
even the telephone. I do not own a mobile phone. That's one of the reasons why it's so peaceful. Do you want to give up your mobile phones? Don't you want to be peaceful? <laughs> but anyhow, I didn't have any mobile phone. The nearest telephone, a landline, was about 100 meters, 200 meters away. And I, having to crawl there, even if you got a line uh, through, I remember going to a I remember going to a person's house or having some uh, domestic issues and uh, the fellow was suicidal. I had to go and talk to him to make sure he didn't sort of uh, kill himself. But nevertheless, you know, he was very depressed, violently depressed and even he had this wonderful, this lovely glass engraved window and he banged it through with his hand. He cut himself but not that badly. But then I thought, I'd better call the police. And imagine, you call the police, and they say, there's a person who is, you know, getting violent, he's depressed, I'm concerned for his well-being. And the operator on the end, other end of the line said, can you speak up, please? Shh, this will make him even more terrified if he knows the police is coming. Sorry, I can't hear you. Have you ever done anything like that for, with the police? Sometimes they have to know that these are very dangerous situations. So if you call, they have to have something to amplify your voice. What's the address? Can you repeat that, please? So a lot of times on the phone when you need emergency help is sometimes not the best. So I gave up even trying to go and give a telephone call. Instead I stayed in the cave where I live. And I said, what if we can't get any help and you got this terrifying stomach poisoning, what can you do? And of course you do the mindfulness, all those things which you talk to others about but adding this extra ingredient called kindness became kindfulness. So you had these you know, terrible spasms in your tummy. And then when one came, I never tried to fight it, be embarrassed about it. It really is mindfulness, is letting it be, allowing it to be but with kindness. This is just how the body deals with all this bacteria you know, causing this irritation you know, in your stomach. And what I notice, if it really is what we now call kindfulness, what happens is the, the body relaxes. If I'm kind to you, you can relax. Are you afraid of me? Those who haven't seen me before, maybe, but if you've seen me many times, <laughs> many times, you relax, that's just old Ajahn Brahm. So that relaxation makes you uh, become more at ease, and you can listen, and you can understand much better. So when we are um, practicing that kindfulness, I could actually understand what my body was telling me. It was really tight, afraid, stressed out. I'm looking upon my body just as I would look at any part of your body. What it needed most of all was some reassurance, some kindness. And every time these very painful spasms came, I was just kind to them, really kind. Which meant the next time a spasm came, it was less painful. It was softer. I softened those spasms. The time the next one came, I softened it again. The next one softened it again. It took about half an hour. Sometimes, I can't remember exactly the time, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, so these days I say half an hour. And after 30 minutes of doing this, 
the spasms never came back again. They got so soft they didn't need to recur. And I meditated and I felt so peaceful, didn't even have a tummy ache afterwards. And sometimes I thought, how can that be possible? Never took any medication, no painkiller, no water, nothing. Just being with the, um, <coughs> uh, the pain and just allowing it to disappear. I didn't make it disappear. I allowed it to disappear. And afterwards I kind of wondered, how can this happen? These are bacteria. They should, you know, they can't just disappear. They must be still in your stomach somewhere. Why aren't they causing any problems or trouble? And then I kind of imagined, the last time <coughs> I saw a bacteria in science class looking through a, a microscope, a little blob with you know, a few tentacles coming out, that's how I remember it. And I thought that all these blobs of bacteria causing all these problems. Now, because I was being kind to them, they had all their tentacles cross-legged in a meditation position. And they were gently, <laughs> gently meditating peacefully in my tummy. I know that may be uh, not quite accurate what was happening, but certainly when I was peaceful, they became peaceful. And that was the end of that stomach that uh, food poisoning in my stomach never reoccurred. Oh, how can this happen? This is the art of kindfulness. How when you practice it properly, not trying to get rid of things, but being with things, how all this can disappear. You know one thing about medicine, I hope I'm... How many people here are doctors? you, I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things about medicine which people have told me is that you have no autonomy. A lot of the times when a doctor says, you know, you've got to take this medication, you've got to take that medication, we have to do this surgery or that surgery, is taking out, you know, your power over your own body. And that is missing out on something which is very beautiful, you know, in the healing of your own body. Learning yourself how to deal with the aches and pains and difficulties which we all experience from time to time. And for so many years now, actually just about a week before I came here, I, once a year I go to this volunteer cancer support association once a year they came, come to our monastery to do a meditation day. And I've been going there for such a long time, over 30 years, maybe 35 years I reckon. And when I first went there, one of the people, the ladies, who had had uh, breast cancer and had one of her breasts removed, you know, she asked a question after the talk, she said, the doctor says I'm in remission, but what would happen if the breast cancer came back? You know what my answer was? This was the first time I went there. What would happen if the breast cancer never came back? A very simple answer. But that meant the whole world to her. She never thought that before. She was so focused on the fear of having to deal with this again. She never even contemplated the possibility it might not come back. And that's why she made sure that I came back every year, not the cancer. <laughs> <laughs> I had some fun doing this because eventually the, this Cancer Support Association that was in the suburb where the Premier of Western Australia lived. He actually just lived around the corner, it's very close. And so because it was a local electorate, he asked you know, the Parliament to have money to upgrade it. So they upgraded it into a multi-million dollar faculty. 
you know, for treating people who have all, any type of cancer or people who had relations who had cancer. And because of that, they had to have a grand opening. And I was invited to that grand opening together with the Premier. And I asked, why me? There was no other religious leaders there. And that was a story they told me because these little stories had actually meant so much to the people who go there. So they wanted me to help bless it. And one of the things I did enjoy doing was when I was blessing this place, I blessed it with you know, traditional Buddhist blessings of holy water. I did have to ask the premier security guard, this is what I'm doing, it's not dangerous, <laughs> can I do this? <laughs> and I said, yeah, okay. So I had a really nice time dousing the premier of Western Australia with holy water. <laughs> I was laughing my head off. <laughs> so anyway, this is actually how we can um, really be of service with mindfulness and kindness. Look, let's analyze what happens if it comes back again. It's the fear that makes it come back again. A lot of the time, the fear of catching COVID makes you tense. And when you're tense and scared, that's not a good mind state to keep a healthy body. You can overdo this, but sometimes ask yourself, wherever you go, are you afraid? Too many people in our world are overly afraid. And that's why that tightness, tension in our body makes us susceptible to this. When I was a student, one of the authors I liked to read was this gentleman called Edgar Allan Poe. And he was a very scary author, but at least he was original. And one of his uh, books was The Mask of the Red Death. And they imagined his spirits were going to the, this was like two, three hundred years ago, his spirits were going to the major capitals of Europe and killing so many people with these diseases. And they met in a forest somewhere outside of France to compare notes. How many people did you kill in London? Or about 6,000. How many did you kill in Frankfurt? Or about 7,000. How many did you kill in Paris? And this little spirit said, I only killed 300 and fear killed 10,000. And I remember that little statement that really stayed with me for such a long time. How much is it that fear is one of the worst diseases in our world? It's a fear which mostly kills us, creates the cancers, allows the same bacteria which may be in me and you to manifest themselves differently. The viruses, they may detect a virus inside of you, inside of me, but I'm at peace with those viruses. They don't infect anybody else, they don't really manifest in me. So this is fascinating stuff about medicine and how human health and the way of treatment. That's one of the reasons why one of the best remedies for all sorts of diseases, infections or whatever, is learning how to find a quiet place where you can relax to the max, be kind, be gentle and allow the body to heal. For the last time I went to a hospital to be treated was, that's right, 32 years ago. And I remember it very well. I don't know exactly what I had. These days they probably call it uh, chronic fatigue or something. I just lost all my energy, didn't know why. 
And I say, I'm just all resting up in monastery. But one of the disciples there, the followers, he was a Sri Lankan doctor. And so he asked me, why don't you come into my hospital? And I just do so, what do doctors do? Tests. I do some tests on you. In other words, I hadn't got a clue what they were doing. Do you, do you trust doctors? Sometimes, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> they do so many tests. And sometimes they don't find it on the first test, they give another test, and then another test. Uh, the only way you can get rid of them okay, is when they find something right. Imagine that was you, you know, in a, in a school, and you had so many tests, and they didn't find anything. Would that be a good uh, teacher? Look, I'd, I'd tell I'd like another story. I think I'm going to get banned from this place if I keep going on and telling these stories about doctors. <laughs> but nevertheless, there's one of the student, the doctors, that they were treating this person who had the anxiety disorder so bad that you know, she had to have her oxygen mask on all the time. She had you know, chronic anxiety and could hardly breathe. So the doctor told me that as she was trained to give this medication first of all, if that doesn't work, give another medication. If that doesn't work, give it a third medication. And on one afternoon, on a Thursday afternoon, she'd given all the, the medications she could, everything which was in the book. Nothing was working. So she was tired. She wanted to get home and take a rest. So she told this patient, let's try another method. Ajahn Brahm's method. <laughs> she said if she was, you know, you know, not so tired, she wouldn't have ever suggested this because it's not been medically approved. And what that method is, is you know, from when I had, you know, when I had a student who had, a med had chronic anxiety, so anxious she was in bed in, hos in uh, student accommodation in Adelaide. And she couldn't even get out of bed. That's how anxious she was. She was terrified. And even doctors and psychologists could not do anything to help her. So then, because her uncle was uh, a follower of mine over in Perth, she asked, he told her, go and give Ajahn Brahma a call. The nice thing about getting advice from monks, it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> We're good value for money. <laughs> we don't charge anything. And the same with all my books outside. <laughs> I know they're selling them, but please, if you don't like them, if it doesn't work, you're allowed to ask for your money back. I promise that. It's recorded. You are allowed to ask for your money back. You won't get it back, but you're allowed to ask. <laughs> That's my marketing. <laughs> but anyhow, this lady, she was in bed, confined to her bed. No one could help her. And then, this was a mindfulness technique. I asked her, and I wanted her to take some responsibility over her own body and her own therapy. So I asked her, when you have those anxiety attacks, do they have a corresponding feeling on your body? I said, yes, and my, my chest starts to hurt. So you know, what does it feel like? Well, it's kind of painful. I said, that's not good enough. I'm going to give you a call in three days' time. I want you to describe to me accurately what that f pain feels like. Is it hot? Is it throbbing? Is it tense? What is it? Describe it. And you've got three days to let me know. 
And after three days, and she was at Adelaide University, a very smart girl, and she told me what it felt like. Such a detailed description, that's all she had to do. She's in bed all day, couldn't get out of bed. In three days, she told me this really good description of how it feels when you have a panic attack. I said, it's great. Now, where is that feeling censored, uh, centered on? Is it just like the whole of your, your chest, or is it to the left, to the right? Does it change position? And then she said, well, I don't really know. Give me a call in three days' time. I want an explanation. And then, three days' time, that's all she had to do. It gave her something to do. It was getting her to take charge of her therapy. She gave this wonderful description. And I said, I don't need to want general. I want, now you're a scientist. She was actually studying dentistry. But I want, you know, from your navel, your belly button, how many centimeters up does it go? How many centimeters to the left, to the right? Is it actually centered or is it more to the left, more to the right? I want precise details. All I was telling her to do was to be more mindful, to really get to know those feelings. And so she gave a really good description and I said, wonderful, now this is what I want you to do. Next time you have one of those panic attacks, you know exactly where it is, where it manifests in your body. Take your hand and massage that area. Give it a nice good massage. She was being looked after by her boyfriend, Lloyd. I'll tell you why I know all the names in a few moments. <laughs> and I said, look, if you feel too tired and exhausted to massage your chest, get Lloyd to do it for you. I'm sure he will be very willing. <laughs> <laughs> and give me a call in three days' time. And then this is nine days of Ajahn Brahm method, and for nothing. And then after those nine days, he called again. I said, did you follow the instructions? Said, yes, yeah. Whenever I had anxiety attacks, I felt it in the chest, the physical manifestation. I massaged it. What happened? And then she said, well, because I was massaging my chest, the physical manifestation, the tightness of tension disappeared. I said, what happened to the cause of that, your anxiety? And I'll never forget that moment, because it was called like the Einstein moment. No, not the Einstein, the Archimedes moment. A light bulb came up in her mind. So it went away. When the physical manifestation disappeared, so did the cause, the anxiety itself. Okay, now you know the treatment. And I hung up. Every emotional problem you have is manifested somewhere in your body. With anxiety, it's usually in the chest area a tightness of tension, you know the physical manifestation. That's easier to deal with and to solve. And when that goes, the cause goes as well. The anxiety disappears. And the reason why I know everybody in that family is I was told by the uncle that she was so impressed that on a telephone a mug had taught her how to deal with anxiety effectively that she nominated me for Australian of the Year. <laughs> Very cute. Never got it. But <laughs> then afterwards, of course, you know, she was out of bed in a week and then back to her studies. And then she finished you know, top of the class and she specialised in some kind of dentistry over in, uh, I think, Melbourne. And then eventually she wanted to marry uh, Lloyd. And so they insisted, we couldn't get you Australian of the Year, but can you please be the monk who officiates and blesses us at our marriage? So basically I married them. <laughs> <laughs> and they got two lovely kids. I saw them only a few weeks ago. A Buddhist monk had done something 
which the doctors couldn't do. And that's why this doctor over in the hospital had a lady tried all the, the legal medicines and then decided, try a jump arms method, okay? When you have an anxiety attack, where do you feel it? So I feel it in my chest. Well, just rub your chest. And then she left. You know, didn't have much time to say anything. And when she came on a Friday morning to check on this patient, <laughs> she had an oxygen mask off and said, I feel better now, thank you, I'm going home. <laughs> and <laughs> the doctor told me that, said, am I going to get into trouble? He said, no, you don't have to get into trouble, I'll get into trouble for you, is my method. But it works. Every emotional disease, fear, anxiety, even hatred. If you're angry at someone, that's manifested somewhere in your body. If that anger is a problem for you, get to know how it feels. Be mindful, don't be judgmental. Be aware exactly where it's manifested and do something like a nice soft massage. The anger vanishes, it can't stand that. And then you know how to deal with anger. So if you see anybody in your company, the CEO, or anyone in Parliament, anyone anywhere in the world, they go <coughs> rubbing their tummy. Now you know what they're doing. <laughs> Overcoming the manifestations of these emotional blockages, which cause so much trouble in our world. So that's the example of how mindfulness and kindness work. So, today, we started only at 10 o'clock, but because I am a monk, because uh, I have to finish my meal before midday, that I'm going to have to leave a tiny bit earlier than you were supposed to be. What was it time, Gerald? 11 o'clock. But so what I'm going to do, what I did yesterday at Hong Kong University, I'm going to start you meditating. I meditate with you for about 20 minutes, and then very quietly, I'm going to get up and go out of the door, and hopefully, you won't know I'm gone. <laughs> I'll be back at 1:30. So you just keep meditating here until 1.30. <laughs> That's only a joke. I think that your lunch boxes come at 11.30. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Okay, so I'll just leave half an hour before. But there are the cameras in this room. Yeah, I will know whether you, as soon as I get out of the door, <laughs> whether you get out of the door as well. Now be kind to yourself. I'll be back to answer more questions and also to teach more meditation later on. So in the meantime, an important part of m meditation is to be able to be kind to yourself. So before we start meditating now, please stand up. And have a good stretch. Oh. Mm. Excellent. <laughs> it's really funny watching some of you how you stretch and dance. Mm -mm. Okay. You know where I grew up in Thailand. They used to call elderly men, the, I, the word for man was poor, poor oi. And elderly women, mer oi. And when I asked, why do they call them like that? So when they get up, they go, oi. <laughs> 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 so, so the poor ois and the mer ois, please you can sit down now, oi. <laughs> Do have Gerald's clock here. So, 
and you don't have to be concerned. I'm not here after tw after um, eleven. Actually, where's Carol gone? Oh, there you are. Could you please ring the gong at eleven thirty? So you don't have to worry. Just enjoy the meditation. If you feel it's not working for you, it's quite okay to get up and have a stretch or just to walk quietly outside. But please don't make any noise. Because many other people would be loved to actually to, to stay here and meditate deeply. Okay. And if you are sleepy, please don't sit cross-legged on the chairs. Because you can see that sometimes they start getting sleepy and they nod more and more and more. And if you're on a chair, <laughs> you'll fall off. <laughs> okay, you were warned. Okay, so I'll guide the first 10 minutes of this. <laughs> So first of all, close your eyes, you can be more sensitive to how your body feels. I'm feeling my body now. This is called the beginnings of mindfulness of your own body. And I take it more precisely. I start to ask, feet, how are you feet? When you ask a question like that, I ask one of you, oh, Freddie, how are you? then Freddie will tell me. He's honest. That's how I know how Freddie might feel today. I'll do the same to my feet. Feet, how are you? And my awareness goes to that area of my body and I can get to know how my feet feel. And I can move them if they need to move, which they did. It's one of the reasons I love meditating with no shoes or socks on. Because right now I'm enjoying the experience of the soles of my feet touching the bamboo floor. Is it bamboo? It's wood. Touching the wooden floor. You get to be more sensitive to the textures of things. At the same time, I make sure my feet are relaxed. Relaxed to the max. And I can know that feeling of relaxation. Do you know what relaxed feels like? There's so many people get sick because they're not relaxed. Or they don't know how to. And this simple method is also really helpful to sleep deeply at night, relaxing your body stage by stage. Counting sheep or whatever other people do is just way too busy. Just relaxing your body and enjoying the feelings of now my feet are very relaxed. So I move my attention up from my feet to my legs. It's like you're sweeping up the body like a CT scan might sweep one area of your body. This is doing it with your mindfulness, with your awareness. Lower legs, how do you feel? And I've done this for so long now that right now I can feel the the muscles and the calves of both legs. 
they're not a problem, but just being able to check in with them is very helpful. And this is one of the reasons why any diseases, cuts or bruises can heal very quickly. They just let go of all inflammation. It's supposed to be protecting any wounds or bruises, which actually stop the rest of the body's energies from going there and healing it. I checked my knees. How do your knees feel right now? Once you are aware of them, then you can relax them. So I go up to my thighs. How do they feel? You know, the feelings in the muscles in my calves are very different from the feelings of the muscles in my thighs. I don't know why, but I can tell that difference. And now I learn how to relax those muscles. How do you do that? Try trial and error. Or like kindness. Be kind to those muscles. When you're kind to them, mindfulness can give you feedback. So you can be aware yourself whether they're getting more tense or more relaxed. Then I go to my buttocks, sitting on a chair. I can never sort of abolish those feelings in my buttocks, the weight of my body being transferred onto the cushion of the chair. What I do is to make sure it's even. When it's even, I know it, those feelings will soon disappear. The mind can only notice things which stand out, which change. When there's a constant feeling there, you don't notice it change, notice it disappear. Then I go to my uh, waist. And at this point, uh, I know I'm leaning against the chair, but I'm going to sit up straight on the chair. It kind of makes me feel stronger and more comfortable. Lean back if you wish. Don't follow the position I put my body in but follow the method of finding what's most comfortable for you. And then I go to the bottom of my torso and I do this scanning method, moving from the lowest part, scanning centimeter by centimeter up my torso, and getting to know my digestive system and any other organs, muscles, which are in this important part of your body. And as I move up my body, if there are any, any tension, pain, unfamiliar sensations, I stay with them and give them lots of kindness. And when I give them such compassion, they feel like they've been noticed. Somebody cares for them. And they start to relax more, to be more at ease.
eventually get to my stomach. I can actually feel the muscles in my stomach. Just being practicing awareness such a long time. My stomach feels at ease, well balanced. I had a breakfast a long time ago. And it feels comfortable. Go up past the stomach to the lungs. I can feel those lungs breathing. I'm not just kind to them. So the breath goes in more peacefully. Breathing in peace. Breathe out, let go. We go up to the heart region. Being kind, being mindful to each part of my body. Eventually get to the shoulders. In order to relax those shoulders, I try the, the method of making them more tense, first of all, scrunching up those shoulders. And then letting them go. Not putting any effort or requirements, but letting them fall to a natural state of relaxation. I like teaching that because it describes what letting go is. Scrunching is not letting go. But when you stop the effort to scrunch, then the muscles relax. And I scan down my arms. Got no injuries down there. If you have an injury, had an operation somewhere, please pause and give that part of your body kindness. It's amazing how quickly you heal those wounds or surgery or bruises with such kindness. Eventually I go to my hands. I make sure, you know, scanning down the, the arms, and just asking my fingers, fingers, are you happy there? Do you want to be rearranged? moved. And today my fingers are no need. Go back up to my neck. The neck is sometimes tense because my head is well is not well positioned on top of the neck. So I move my head to the right, the left, move my head up and down until I can feel the optimum position. And I go to my head itself, to the face. And be aware of the muscles around the eyes, around the mouth, around the nose. And I loosen them. I don't hold anything tight. So my eyes are still closed, but lightly. The tension which is sometimes in the front of your face when you're worried or you're stressed, relax and disappear. Now I feel my whole body sitting here as a unit, not in parts. Relax to the max. And hopefully, if this method is working well for you, when I can be aware of my whole body sitting here, it gets even more relaxed. And with that relaxation, I start to experience the joy of relaxation, the delight of a body which is carrying no burdens. Yes, I have 
things to make decisions on about the past. I have duties in the future. But right now, I put those down and do them here. In this moment, with a peaceful body. And that allows me to let go of the body. And this word peace, I focus on that. How peaceful am I right now? How peaceful are you? What does it feel like to get to know the quality we call peace? Peace affects the body, but peace lives in your mind. When you're at peace, the whole body relaxes and the mind relaxes from any stress. Stress is pulling, stretching things, squashing things. And you're just letting things be. See if when you let things be, this quality of peace becomes softer and more delightful. But not just peace, take it deeper into silence. When you stop giving things names, you stop taking notes in your mind or judging, assessing. Please leave those jobs until after the meditation. I learned that as a scientist. You do experiment. You don't figure out the meaning of the results until all those results are completed. I'm going to finish speaking now. See if you can just continue in this moment, peaceful, with inner silence, to see what happens. <laughs>